of slides to come up. But I just, in the meantime, I just wanted to um, thank the speakers for the last talk. I think it's a really um, amazing thing that you're trying to do there. Um, and I, I just wanted also to, to mention a, a project that um, Smart Design has recently been doing with uh, the national campaign for teen and unplanned pregnancy. My, my Twitter handle is at Whitehall, so very um, simple. And I tweeted the link this morning with some details of that project. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about it a little bit in my presentation, but um, only very lightly. Um, and uh, so there's the Twitter handle there. Um, and I just, like, I think it was a very similar experience in that we were kind of working with a, a group of women aged 18 to 29, working, um, looking at really their, their sex lives, how birth control plays a part in that. And it was a pretty amazing um, journey, and there's some very interesting insights there. So I'd encourage everybody to have a look at that. Um, so let's get started. So first of all, I just wanted a show of hands. Um, who in the room would consider themselves to be an optimist? Wow, I think that's about 90%. OK, that's very good. So I would expect that from a, from a service design audience. Great. Um, who in the room would consider themselves to be a realist? OK, I think we got about 30% we there. Um, so I think traditionally, design and service design has been full of a lot of optimists, which I think is a, important to get things done. I think you really have to start with an attitude of optimism. But I think as service design challenges are getting more and more um, complex, um, we're seeing the, the, the need for sort of realists to move into the, the, the camp as well. And I think as the challenges get more complex, I think we need both extreme optimists, so people who really feel like they can cut through these big challenges, like the, the kind of VA project. But we also need to bring in extreme realists who really understand what's going on on the ground in the organization. And it's only by kind of doing that that we're really going to be able to, to solve the um, challenges ahead of us. So my presentation is going to really focus on that. Um, I just wanted to put this quote up. So Smart Design started in New York in 1980. This is what the subway looked like then. Uh, a little bit, little bit different to now. Um, and uh, the kind of founding principle is really that design is about people. And it's kind of amazing that this conference is really uh, talking about that same topic 35 years on. Um, I think when people think about us, they think about um, people being um, people that use services um, and people that um, maybe provide them frontline. But I'd say a lot of the work that we really do is about the, the people that exist within organizations and how we partner with them to empower them to, to roll out services. I think that's, that's just as important a part. So I'm going to really focus on that side of things um, in what I'm talking about this morning. Uh, and also, design is about coffee, right? Everybody loves coffee in um, design firms. Um, so it seems like a very simple challenge to create a good cup of coffee on a plane. This is really a, a very simple challenge compared to some of the massive thorny problems we're kind of uh, looking at. Um, I've seen a couple of uh, airlines trying to innovate in this area. So um, Scandinavian Airlines, there's a video online if you want to look at it, um, brought a uh, six times Danish uh, barista champion on one of their um, flights. And he managed to make 170 cups in 30 minutes on this one flight. Um, so they're really optimists. This guy was walking around with, with glass containers, breaking all sorts of safety rules. Um, and I guess everybody got a good cup of coffee, <laughs> um, but is that really a scalable solution? Um, on the other hand, we look at the, the merger between United and Continental, right? They, they actually brew 62 million cups of coffee a year, which is pretty incredible. Um, and uh, they, when they merged, they wanted to integrate their, their coffees. So it seems like a pretty simple thing. Um, and the project actually took, it took one year. They set up a 14-person executive committee to look at coffee. Um, they got 12 bids from different coffee manufacturers all, all over the country. Um, and their coffee was tasted by 1,100 people within the organization. So uh, a pretty big effort. They included people from all these different divisions in the company. Um, and can you guess what happened after a year? So they rolled the solution out, and uh, they got a huge barrage of complaints saying that the coffee was really watery. <laughs> <clears throat> so what they hadn't looked at was that the, the baskets on the Continental flights were a few millimeters shorter than the ones on the United planes. So the water was leaking over the side and getting in everybody's coffee. <laughs> 
So I think it just goes to show the, the importance of making sure you bring in the right people into these projects. And obviously, there are strategies like prototyping and uh, all those things that are going to make that happen. Um, and I think in sort of general, we're, you know, we kind of think of uh, the sort of back of house side of the service blueprint as being the, the realm of realists. I think lots of realists live in this um, space. And maybe the customer journey is the, the uh, arena of optimists um, traditionally. But I think really the kind of focus has to be maybe kind of shifting that so we have a little bit more optimism with the realists back of house um, and actually a little bit more realism with the optimists front of house. So I think that's, that's something that is, is hard to do because I think we are getting this more extreme um, need for extreme perspectives on uh, programs. Um, so I'm just going to talk about one, one project that um, Smart Design uh, worked on. Um, it actually rolled out um, in the city um, this month. So in the next three years, there are going to be 10,000 uh, Taxi of Tomorrow vehicles, um, which was a, a taxi really that we, we sort of designed from a service perspective. So really thinking about the, the journey of the driver and the passenger and trying to create an experience around that. Um, so um, this cab is kind of hailed as the, the um, savior of the yellow cab in New York, because it actually provides a, a customer experience, which I think is, is, is better than Uber in terms of a ride. Um, and they have launched an app as well, so they're, they're trying to move into that space. I think we'll see what happens, but I think it's a, um, it's a really positive thing for cab, cab drivers. Um, so it shouldn't have really taken 10 years, but um, this project actually started in 2005 with a design competition, lots of fantastic ideas. Um, and we came into it in 2006. That was about when the, when it, when the iPhone first launched, so um, <laughs> a very different world. Um, and we kind of helped sort of create um, a um, really a sort of common understanding of the kind of journey and then move that through a, a, a kind of process with the um, city. Um, so during that time, you know, Uber launched. Um, and now Uber actually has more vehicles than yellow taxis on the road. So it's a very different environment now. Um, on the project, I mean, we, we definitely focused on passengers and drivers. But to get an initiative like this through, um, it really requires a much broader range of stakeholders to be involved. Uh, we were working with an organization called the Design Trust, which is an NGO um, uh, trying to improve public space. During the course of the project, we had to bring on New York City, so we had to convince the mayor that this was a good thing to do. Um, and then we also had to go through a, a bidding process and select a manufacturer and roll it out. So it's it a very complex um, journey. Um, I think a few of the key things that we did in order to make this possible, um, I think first of all is um, in the first few weeks, getting everybody on the same, same page about you know, what are the issues of the driver, what are the issues of the passenger, getting all the parties in one room to really co-create that journey. So I mean, we're strong believers in sort of creating things uh, on boards with post-its, not locking them down too much, um, and then really getting everybody in very early on to align. And I think that even helped us align on terminology, so we're using similar words for similar areas, and we could really um, kind of communicate well. Um, I think the second key thing was just open prototyping platforms. So this project was for an NGO, so it was actually one of the few projects that we could talk about um, publicly. So we, we set up um, two standard vehicles. We didn't want to think about custom vehicles, because that really wasn't feasible within this um, program. Uh, we got two vehicles, set them up in our um, studio, and we actually open sourced the project within the studio. So anybody of the 80 people that work at Smart could sort of come and pick off a bit of the experience. So that was a very interesting process. We used to have um, client meetings sitting in the cabs so that we could see what it was like to have a so social interaction with someone. Um, and then when people would visit the studio, they were sitting there at the front. So it was the first thing they, they saw. So we had all sorts of interesting feedback even from, from, from that. Um, and then we took it to the next step, taking those two vehicles to the um, New York Auto Show um, and really getting public feedback. So then we got all sorts of people coming into the booth, um, trying out different things. We created two vehicles. One was, was a kind of sketch vehicle with some more far out ideas and then a more conservative vehicle to to get some sort of A-B kind of testing from those um, people. And I think that was really critical in, um, in helping people understand that um, maybe the vehicle looks very similar from the outside, but actually there are a lot of interesting things going on inside with the experience that are a little bit different. And I think that's an issue for service designers when we try to explain 
you know, what we do, finding ways to say that. Um, so the other thing was kind of then going through the um, RFP process. So we created a really tight set of experience guidelines. So we had 40 guidelines which were then baked into an RFP, which went out to a series of different auto manufacturers. And we got a load of interesting bids back. So there was one from a Turkish manufacturer called um, Karzan, who was going to build a, um, a custom factory in Brooklyn, manufacturing custom vehicles um, for the cab. On the other side, we had Ford, who basically had a standard vehicle and painted it yellow. <laughs> um, so we kind of ended up um, going with Nissan, which was the which was the middle ground where it was a vehicle that already existed, a light commercial vehicle that um, they were willing to do a lot of customization and work with the city on it. So it, even going through that process was very interesting. Um, you know, things that came out on there were um, our design fees were sort of public, so they got published on a site and people got upset that the city spent so much on design. So all, all sorts of interesting broader issues um, there. Um, and then eventually what happened is um, there was a lawsuit. So the, the medallion owners in the city um, sued um, the city because they didn't want to have to just have one vehicle. They wanted to have choice, even though they, they didn't really know what that vehicle was like. Um, and there was also a change in administration. So Bloomberg, who was a huge um, supporter of the campaign, um, the, switched over to de Blasio, who, of course, because Bloomberg supported it, didn't want to support it. Um, so it got held up. For a, for a long time. But in the meantime, 750 vehicles actually came out onto the streets on the free market. So cab drivers actually started buying these things and using them. And I think when they started creeping out, people started seeing you know, that there were some things about this cab that were much better for the driver, much better for the passengers. And I think that was part of, um, I think it's part of what actually helped the um, lawsuit go, go through was that people got a lot more confidence in the vehicle. And I'd say it was, it was definitely partly about the experience, but I think just as important, like hitting the right cost target, um, making sure that the vehicles were durable so they'd have a long life, um, and even lowering fuel costs kind of was a huge thing. So it's definitely, you know, the kind of rational buy is just as important as kind of uh, the other part of things. So I think there were th the sort of three simple rules which, which I sort of pulled out of this program, but I think apply to it a lot of things that we um, work on. I'm not going to go into design process here. I think there are obvious, there's a lot of detail around that. These are very high level. But I think they're, they're things that everybody should just kind of bear in mind when they're, when they're starting any program. So I think the first one is get up close and personal. So this image is um, a uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu fighter who, um, who beat this huge uh, sumo fighter in a, uh, in a contest. And I think, um, I think this is relevant because you know, generally, design projects have a very small team of people that are trying to shift a huge organization. And I think there are some things about that um, that are, are kind of like, you know, you can either work with the organization or you can try and move the whole thing. And I think the, the philosophy of trying to find ways to work with the organization um, and, and shift it, I think, is the way that we should be thinking about it. Um, one observation I have is that a lot of designers uh, come from relatively small and young organizations. <clears throat> Those organizations generally operate as kind of informal networks. So I think um, there's not too much structure to them. We formulate teams around getting the right people and personalities in the room. And that's very different from large organizations um, who generally, you know, because they've been around for a while, uh, specialization has come, there are hierarchies within that kind of organization. And you can't really understand someone or understand how they behave without understanding where they sit in that organization and kind of hierarchy. And I think making sure that when we enter projects, you know, we get to know our clients both on a personal level and in terms of where they sit within the organization and what they're trying, trying to achieve. Um, there was one client that I was working with and I really couldn't understand some of his behavior ultimately. And I think it came down to some very you know, written down objectives on his scorecard, which he was going to be measured against at the end of the year. And if he didn't achieve those, um, then that was going to affect his bonus. And without understanding that, <laughs> it's very difficult to work with people in a, in a human-centered way. Um, so I think going in, you know, we call these organizational orthodoxies. But I think going in and trying to understand some of the key key factors of an organization that affect the, the service that they're rolling out early on. And I think this is done 
you know, very standard methods, stakeholder interviews, group sessions, code creation, all these things work, but trying to get a handle on these key things and then understanding how each person sits within that, I think is um, a great way to start. I think the second part of it then is getting to know people personally, and I think that's, that's just, just as important. And I think during the kind of process, we, you know, we like to take a playful attitude to this. So um, one of the things we've, we, we've done on a recent project is just to create kind of bingo cards with um, things that we've overheard people saying. So these are some of the things that some of the, some of the design team on the project said. So things like, let's talk about that, which I think is a thing that designers say a lot to open up the problem and have a discussion. Um, and then we did a similar uh, bingo card for uh, for, the, for the business strategist on the project. So there was a, a whole load of different cliches here, um, which are pretty funny. Um, and he would always be saying, let's table this for now. So it was kind of interesting that there was this sort of designer trying to open things up, and then the business person really trying to get everything on track. Um, and I think it's critical on, on projects that, that people from a design and business ground you know, work together, and there are, there are some strengths and, and, you know, that you can really um, pull on. So, you know, business people love, love Excel, powerful analytical tool for, for analyzing data really quickly, right? Designers love Post-its. That's our equivalent, something very flexible that we can move around, malleable in our world. Business people are amazing at navigating organizational politics, so figuring out who you should talk to in the organization, how you should approach them, what they care about. That's super powerful on, on sort of any project. Designers are great at offering an outside perspective, you know, pulling in a great example from the outside world um, and pulling that into the organization. Um, business people are great at using data to quantify problems, so trying to figure out maybe where we, where we start digging on a very large problem or how we make a business case that supports a really great user experience. Um, and design people are great at telling human anecdotes, so, so kind of little stories that that really bring um, you know, these kind of moments of truth to, um, to uh, projects. Um, business people generally want to start with an idea, uh, whereas design people want to land on an idea. So that's a very big difference. And I think you know, the way that we quite often do this is really to, to use the, the kind of business strategy to generate hypotheses at the beginning that we can explore and expand on. And I think it can be a really powerful combination working, working together. Um, I'm just going to talk about, very briefly, um, uh, a project we did with a health insurance company to um, redesign their, their health insurance offering. And I think the, the, the really interesting thing about this project, I think, is that it was um, co-sponsored by the customer experience group and the service operations group um, in the company. And the customer experience um, uh, sponsor on the project was someone who was just very enthusiastic about hospitality experiences, you know, very inspired by the things in her life. Um, the service operations person was a Six Sigma black belt, so pretty hardcore process person. And I think when we, when we started the project, we, we, you know, how's this going to work? These two people are so different. How are we going to make it all come together? But I think throughout the process, they, there was sort of an amazing partnership, and the two of them really had that yin-yang um, thing actually during the uh, project. Um, and I'm not going to go into it in any detail, but I think a kind of critical thing, the sort of service blueprint was a really important part of it, because I think it enabled the service operations team to go into the organization and create sort of process maps, understand different things in the employee experience, whereas the customer experience team, and we were working with kind of both, was then going into the outside world with, with um, customers and clients. And I think we identified some interesting gaps which, which actually connected those um, two things. So that was really important. Okay, um, I'm not going to recap. Um, so second thing is just, um, I think it's really important uh, during the project to you know, focus on getting people out of their, out of their personal space and their, and their worlds. Um, this is my, my morning cycle over the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, you know, I find sometimes when I'm, when I'm lying in bed, I'm an ultimate realist and I'm thinking about all the issues that are coming up during, during the day, but as soon as I get on my bike, I feel I get some objectivity, I feel inspired. And I think that, that sort of general philosophy, I think, applies to the way we like to work with teams on projects as well. Um, so first thing is it doesn't have to take long. This is a project for a, a really complex mobility service that's being piloted globally, um, so hugely um, complex. But just within the first week, getting the, the client team, uh, the design team, 
you know, Uber drivers, um, passengers, people who kind of use taxis and different services just into a very crude cardboard mock-up to look at some of the social interactions that are happening. So um, in this example, um, you know, I decided I would eat my lunch uh, uh, on the vehicle. And we were just looking at you know, what was the service rule around eating food. We hadn't even really thought about that. So five minutes left, so I'm going to hurry up. Um, I just want to talk quickly about just process. So I think in general, you know, we've been moving towards a model where we, we kind of try and set up a piloting platform on a project. So in this case, it's a, a learning lab in Sao Paulo for um, a drinks company um, looking at a new technology platform. Um, and then use that as a place where we can go and learn throughout the course of the project. So a place, again, that's outside of our office, outside of the client's office. Um, <clears throat> and we can generate a series of sprints where we can we can continually learn. And I think this enables us to be, be less kind of cautious about taking risks because we can try something out that's a bit more risky in this first sprint, knowing that we're going to learn from it and move to another one. And I think that, that kind of philosophy of um, <clears throat> sort of creating a um, portfolio of ideas rather than just pushing one idea through is um, very important. Um, and then just kind of wrapping up, I think I'll wrap up here. Um, this is the, the, the project that I mentioned at the, at the beginning. This was um, a campaign, an awareness campaign for um, two methods of birth control, the IUD and the implant, which are really highly effective methods of birth control. Um, we worked for a year with 64 women all over the country, um, you know, understanding their relationships, their sex lives, how they thought about birth control. Um, I was the creative director on the project. I never met any of the women. Um, so obviously, there's, there's kind of a lot of nuance to doing this um, research, which is a very interesting aspect to it. Um, but it's at the point now where we've, we've created a series of pilot campaigns which are going out to communities all over the country. This launched this week again, so it's very kind of fresh. And I think this approach is really, um, we're really looking to kind of find out what should be the elements of a national campaign. So we want to start off by understanding reactions in different communities, looking at the different engagement methods that we're um, offering, um, and then figuring out how we Again, how we iterate our way to the right solution. Um, just a few things you can find if you go to the website. There, there's a really great insights um, booklet in there that kind of pulls out some of the key insights that we found um, through our work. Um, one of the interesting things about this is this has now gone out to the healthcare provider community. So the campaign was targeted at um, young women, but um, it's actually helped healthcare providers figure out how to have a better dialogue with their with their patients. So a lot of um, there's been a lot of talking at conferences and trying to convince people within the healthcare community that um, that there are different ways. For, for example, they were talking about these methods as highly effective. Um, we said they should be describing them as low maintenance, which is like a very different mindset. Um, and there's a microsite, so we can go in and sort of track how how all these campaigns are um, kind of going over time. Um, so I'm not going to go through the last one, but um, I think the third thing is just about trying to make sure that your project goes viral within the organization. And I think service designers work um, on a lot of very complex tools. And I think some of the key things here are really just trying to create things that can be shared sort of virally. So we tend to think like experience principles are really great things for, for sharing, because they, they can be applied to all sorts of problems as we move along whereas a service blueprint is a very dense thing to kind of go through. Um, and then the other thing is just creating artifacts that actually um, go viral, like videos, um, but then also thinking about when you should create things that are physical, which have a longer life. So there are some things that should be books, that should live on people's desks within organizations um, so that we can get much denser information out as well. So I think thinking about all those things so that you really... Within an organization, there are people that you know are going to be engaged in the project, but there's the people that you don't know are going to be engaged. And I think getting the message out more broadly so you can draw people into the project, sometimes from really unexpected um, places, is, is kind of really powerful. I'm just going to go to the last slide because it's just, it's just good. Um, there you go. <laughs> OK, thank you very much. Uh -huh. <laughs>